Hey everyone, welcome back. My name's Dustin Kreiss, and today I'm uh, going to do a movie video. Um, Ball and Nick 1982 just did a movie video. Benzo just did a movie video. Uh, I feel like making a movie video, so I'm going to do um, like they did and do my favorite movies of all time. Um, th and there are some that, you know, I felt like I need to try to make the list a bit different from theirs. So there's going to be stuff on, um, there's going to be stuff missing. Uh, the Back to the Futures won't be on here. Um, Aliens won't be on here. The Alien movies won't be on here. Um, but uh, a lot of the uh, the sort of um, the ones that you expect, a lot of those will be here. But um, I, I try to make the list a little bit more varied um, than those other guys. So there's some variety out there, I guess. So anyway, I got a lot of movies here to get through. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, up first is probably my favorite movie of all time. Um, I don't know what it is, but whenever I'm feeling down and bad, I always put this in and it makes me feel better about my life, and that is Train Spotting. Um, you know, a Danny Boyle film starring Ewan McGregor. Uh, just fast-paced energy. Um, it made me go out and get the book. I love the book as well, but there's just something about watching these uh, this group of misfits um, move through their lives and make their life's decisions, and it, it's at times very funny, at times very scary, and at times um, very sad. So um, it's definitely one of those great movies out there that everyone needs to see. Um, if you want to see something really awesome, go check out Train Spotting. Um, another movie here, this is one that I've talked about quite a bit, uh, both on the podcast and on videos before, so I'm not going to belabor this one, but it's Southland Tales by Richard Kelly. Um, if you like Donnie Darko, I would definitely say give this a shot, but know that this is a, an entirely, at, on one hand it's an entirely different beast, but at the same time it's sort of the, a sort of a familiar beast as well. Um, it's really parts four, five, and six of a six-part story. Um, the Blu-ray does have the first three parts of the graphic novels on the disc, so you can see what's going on. But, you know, more so than, like, the story in this movie, it's just the world they create, sort of this America run amok with interstate uh, visas and checkpoints and just sort of how um, everything spiraled out of control. Um, there's just something about that world that the, this movie creates that I really uh, I find fascinating and also very terrifying as well. So definitely check out Southland Tales. Um, another movie here that's, uh, this is really the epitome of Christmas movies for me. And um, if you take this movie, put it in 1988 and substitute the, the BB gun for a Nintendo Entertainment System, you will have essentially almost <clears throat> the same story, and that is a Christmas story. And I don't think I need to uh, belabor this movie. It's unfortunate that they made A Christmas Story 2, the official sequel, um, that is a steaming pile of garbage, and it, it's, makes me, it's making me want to uh, cancel Christmas this year. Um, but this movie is still a classic. And, uh, you know, you can watch it 24 hours a day on Christmas Eve, so that's really awesome. But uh, I think, and a lot of people, it's, it's starting to wear people out on this. Whereas, um, you know, with me, I only watch it around Christmas time. I make that, you know, and on the 24 hours of A Christmas Story, I only try to watch it once, so I, I, I never wear it out for myself. But uh, fantastic movie, very funny, very true to childhood, I think. It's one of those... Um, like Pete and Pete and uh, maybe The Odyssey. It's very true to what childhood is, so uh, definitely check out A Christmas Story um, in a season-appropriate uh, time. Uh, the next one is kind of a new one, but um, I never thought this movie was going to be as good as it was. And uh, you know, my friend is famous for saying that uh, it's the best father and son movie ever made. And I was just so blown away by this when I finally saw it, and that is Tron Legacy. I uh, love the first movie from when I was a kid, and uh, when I saw that they were making a new one, you know, I kind of felt, um, you know, I, I had a little bit of trepidation about it, and then I saw the, um, I saw that tech demo that they did, um, and I wasn't too impressed with it, you know, I was like, oh, okay, you know, Tron's coming back, but it looked overly um, CG, and it just, it, it didn't have that core heart, because at Tron's heart, it's, you know, it's a story of computers and video games and stuff like that, but there, there really is a human heart at the, at the center of it. And then when I started seeing trailers for this, I was completely blown away by everything they did. And then when I finally saw the movie, I can't wait for more Tron movies. If they keep them this high quality, which I guess the next movie is going to be a start of a trilogy, um, if they keep it this high quality, um, Tron's going to be around for a very, very long time. So definitely check out Tron Legacy. It's, it's one of the best reasons to own a Blu-ray player. 
Um, the next movie is, you know, if I had to pick um, a bet, my favorite uh, Pixar movie, it might be the Incredibles. It's either between this or The Incredibles, and I couldn't really uh, figure it out, but I don't have The Incredibles right now. Um, I let my mom have it when we, I moved out of the house because she really loved that movie as well. Um, but uh, I'm going to have to put Wally up there. And um, I'm a big fan of silent film. And the first half of this movie is essentially a silent film um, filled with all kinds of references back to silent film and old, older cinema. And the thing about it is, is there's barely any dialogue spoken in this. And there's just something about it. the scene where um, Eve's ships takes off and Wally's hanging onto the side and he looks in the window and he points out to the stars. I mean, even talking about it now, I'm kind of getting that sort of, there's just something about it that it really hit me emotionally. And I, I really, it's a very simple love story between two robots. And you wouldn't think that that would be, you know, emotionally, you know, it wouldn't tug on your heartstrings, but it really does. And it's a really, um, I mean, it's a technical marvel just to look at. But it's really a feat of storytelling that um, I don't think Pixar has surpassed. Maybe the first eight minutes of um, Up, that might surpass it as well, because it's kind of the same thing, sort of a silent film. Um, but, uh, yeah, WALL-E, got to check it out. Very fantastic film. Um, I, this is funny how the next two came up, because they're kind of... Um, comparable in a way. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of people would probably put The Matrix on their list. And I love the Matrix series. I even love the sequels. Um, but when I was thinking about it and I started pulling movies out, I was like, I, I really don't have room for the Matrix because I really want um, this movie on here because I don't know if a lot of people have really given this movie the time of day, and they really should, and that is Dark City. Um, Alex Proyas, who also directed I Am Robots and... Uh, shit, I'm drawing a blank now. But um, anyway, um, this is really fantastic and I don't know if a lot of people have seen it because you know it kind of came out at the same time as The Matrix and it was kind of overshadowed and the storylines kind of run parallel a little bit but uh, the thing I love about Dark City is it takes this history of noir which I love film noir and sort of updates it for a more sci-fi fantasy um, a more sci-fi fantasy um, base the only unfortunate, well, they, they fixed it with the director's cut. They took out the um, the opening narration, which really helps the film because you don't know uh, what all is going on. I think that the, the first cut of the film with that opening narration really kind of ruined the film in a lot of ways because you're like, oh, this is what this is about. And uh, this movie, allow, it allows the movie to be weird until the point of revelation. And then you're like, ah, oh, now I see. But uh, so many great things in this movie. Um, I really love the strangers, how they wear their, uh, you know, their um, mink coats and their hats. I think it's a really a wonderful, um, a wonderful sort of uh, visual style. I guess I can't. I'm, I'm losing my mind here. But uh, definitely check out Dark City if you haven't. Um, you will not be disappointed. And um, the thing that I was talking about, these next two movies are kind of, you know. Um, not synonymous, but definitely if you watch Dark City and then you watch this movie or vice versa, whatever order you want to watch, you'll see the influence. And that movie is Metropolis. Um, you guys have to, I mean, if you like sci-fi movies, you have to have this in your collection. And if you like film at all, you have to have at least seen this film. Uh, I'm sorry. You have to see this film. Um, made in 1927, silent film. Re Ridiculous. When you watch this and you're thinking, you think about this is 1927. I mean, the film industry was only, what, like 24 years old at that time? 20, 30 years old at that time. And to see these kind of special effects and the restoration process on this, to see this film, um, you know, they, they put back in some old scenes. And those scenes look rough because they, they basically found um, copies in, a, in Buenos Aires. Um, to c sort of complete the film. But um, the actual pieces of the film, which is a majority of it, that they did restore, it looks like it was shot yesterday. Um, just gorgeous. And the special effects with, um, I, I can't remember, is it uh, Maria, the robot? Um, just mind-blowing. And sort of the, the forced perspectives to make this huge city. 
and uh, just the, the camera tricks that they employ. Like, nowadays we just do CG, and there's no real art. I mean, there's artistry to it, but there's no real fascination to it. It's just like, oh, you just put it in a computer and made a troll. Fantastic. But back in the day, they had to really think about how to do their angles and set up their shots in order to uh, create these uh, marvelous vistas. So if you haven't seen Metropolis, uh, shame on you. You definitely need to check it out. Go find this edition because it is the finally as complete of the movie as we know of right now. I think there's still, if I remember correctly, there's still some interstitial titles. Um you know, for scenes that are still missing. But I, I believe that this is as complete as we're ever going to get the movie. And you have to see it. So, Metropolis. Don't know what else to say. Basically, it's influenced every sci-fi movie ever made. Um, next up, uh, a real classic. And if you want a really amazing detective movie, you have to watch this. That is Chinatown. Um, you know, everyone talks about Jack Nicholson, or, yeah, Jack Nicholson, I almost said Nicholas, I always say that, for some reason I always get that golfer on my mind, uh, Jack Nicholson, you know, The Shining, and Batman as the Joker, and, you know, all these other movies, um, I feel like Chinatown doesn't ever really get, um, a lot of, I mean, it gets a lot of praise from film buffs, but I feel like the general public, this has really fallen out of the limelight, and, um, I really wish a, a lot of people would go back and watch this, because this is a fantastic movie. Very dark. Very dark storyline. Um, and you don't really get that until you get to the end, and you're just like, it just leaves you there, which film noir does. It, 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 this is a, sort of a modern uh, update, you know, modern as in 1970, but uh, update of the film noir genre. And uh, it just kind of leaves you there, and leaves you with all these questions, and it's just a fantastic film. Definitely check it out, Chinatown. Uh, by the way, these are not in any kind of order. Um, they're just, I, I pulled them off the shelf and put them in a pile. Two piles, actually. Uh, the next one is a new movie. And I've actually really wanted to do um, a movie discussion on this. Because I think this just, I mean, when I watched this the first time, and I watched it the first time on Blu-ray, not in theaters. I wanted to see it in theaters, but I never got around to seeing it. It literally blew me away. I watched it um, the next morning again. And that is Moon. Um, Duncan Jones directed this, and he is the son of David Bowie, starring Sam Rockwell, which, my God, Sam fucking Rockwell, um, one of my favorite actors. Everything he's in, I mean, even the most unwatchable movie, um, if, you, if Sam Rockwell is in it, he's still, you, I mean, you just can't take your eyes off him. He's a mesmerizing, um, performer. But this movie... Um, it's such a slow burn, and uh, really what, uh, really a throwback to movies like 2001 and those older 70s sci-fi films that had um, a real brain behind it. You know, it just wasn't whiz-bang technology. It was, you know, it was before Star Wars, um, you know, where science fiction uh, thought about things instead of just being a big, uh, you know, fantasy opera. And uh, they did the special effects in that vein as well, very 70s-minded with miniatures and things like that. And it really shows on the film, um, you know, uh, the, the craft that went into this movie. And then just the storyline is really amazing. And it, it's supposed to be a start of a very um, disconnected trilogy. Um, so I'm really hoping to see more from this universe. But Moon, definitely check it out. Uh, what to do next? We'll do this one next. Um, that is Clerks, and I have to put Clerks in here because this movie showed me that anyone with a good idea, no matter what your technical level is, can make a film. And this is actually why I went into uh, radio television production the first time I went to college. I had uh, you know big uh, ideas of filming a movie and you know becoming the next Kevin Smith. You know stupid stuff, but you know I'm of the generation. Um, where we still dreamed, um, and we weren't pragmatic. So, um, you know, now I'm, now I'm sort of a pragmatist, but back in the day I thought, yeah, I could do that. He did it. I can do it. Um, but this is, you know, it, it it's unfortunate. I, I find it really sad that Kevin Smith is deciding not to make films anymore because, um, I love it when he does films like these, where it's just a bunch of people standing around talking. Now his bigger films, yeah, they might be a little flat. You know, Zach and Miri was funny, but was it as good as the Jersey stuff? No, not really. Um, you know, maybe he's just too popular now, and he, he just, or he's too well-to-do now and can't get back in that mindset. 
But his early films, the, the New Jersey Trilogy, which is actually, what, five or six films? Um, fantastic stuff. I even love Clerks 2. I thought Clerks 2 was a fantastic movie. I really hope somewhere down the line he decides to come back and do a Clerks 3 because, I, you know, Randall, I, I, I've often said this, um, Randall is pretty, in real life, I, I'm pretty much Randall in a lot of ways. I'm a slacker. Um, you know, I'm very crass with people and, uh, I, I, I tend not to take crap. Um, and, you know, Randall has always sort of been a hero to me. Uh, but Clerks, uh, if you haven't seen this, definitely check it out. Uh, the first cut, no, not so much. Um, you know, I, I understand why that movie was cut down and that ending was taken off, but the theatrical version is fantastic. And the documentary in here as well is really fantastic. It goes into the making of the film, but I, I, I love Clerks and I love Kevin Smith, so... Um, next up is the Lord of the Rings of the Western genre, and I'm a big fan of spaghetti westerns, and um, without a doubt, what I view as the best spaghetti western ever made is this one right here, Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, you know, um, Sergio Leone, maker of Fistful of Dollars, A Few Dollars More, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Um, this, I, I, if I remember correctly, this was his final western, because after this, I, I don't think he made any movies for a very long time. And then he made Once Upon a Time in America, which is an excellent gangster film. My favorite sort of mob gangster film of all time is Once Upon a Time in America. But uh, yeah, this movie right here, um, just so epic and so monumental, so mythic. There's a real mythology of the, um, the Old West that I, I find that's like movies like with John Wayne and stuff like that, like the American Westerns, I don't get that in it. But there's something about um, the Italian directors when they directed uh, a Western. They really got that sense of myth and um, larger than life, um, you know, stuff. I mean, there's a reason why like Firefly has Western motifs in it. There's a reason why, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino's making Dej Django Unchained, you know, his own spaghetti Western. Um, very epic movie. So awesome because it's, it's so reliant on like late motifs and, um, really, uh, interesting characterizations. Like, uh, the main character played by Charles Brosnan, um, his, his character's name is Harmonica and sometimes he'll enter a scene and all you hear is the harmonica, him playing the harmonica and then he'll come into frame. You know, it, it's just letting you know that he's here. Um, Henry Fonda as a bad guy fantastic just amazing stuff so if you haven't seen once upon a time in the west you definitely need to go out and get this oh we're about halfway there hopefully i got enough time left on the camera um next up is a new movie just came out not too long ago but man it is it has stormed my brain and it is overtaking every other thing this director has done as my favorite movie by him and that is moonrise kingdom um this is a wonderful portrait of what love is like when you're 12 years old. You know, it doesn't make sense, and uh, it's very sort of over-the-top and kiddish. But at the same time, you know, it, it still has that Wes Anderson trademark of, you know, adults that have grown up sort of dissatisfied with their lives. But it injects this um, youthful energy of the kids and this sort of optimism that I, I don't really think a Wes Anderson film has had um, ever. Maybe since Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket might have been the last film. It may, if, fantastic Mr. Fox as well. Um, but it has this, this sort of optimistic view on things because his, his movies are sometimes a little bit depressing. Um, very funny. Very awesome. I love how he creates his insular worlds. Um, and it really fits this time with this movie because it's set in the 60s. But uh, you definitely want to check out Moonrise Kingdom. I know it didn't come out in a lot of theaters around the country, but you can get it out on Blu-ray now. Fantastic movie. Uh, the next one, I had to put some David Lynch in here, and uh, I really had a hard time picking what might be my favorite David Lynch movie, and um, I had to pick this one, and that is Inland Empire. This is a mindfuck of a movie, and if you like mindfucks of movies, um, you definitely want to see this. It, it, it exists entirely in dream logic, which um, Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway, those kind of skirted the line between a, a, a understandable narrative and dream logic. Um, this is full on like dream nightmare logic. Like it, it, it doesn't make a lick of sense. And there's actually in this movie is two scenes that scared the bejesus out of me. Like I was sitting on the couch watching this terrified of these two scenes and they're nothing bad. And, you know, after you watch this movie and I tell you what they were, you're going to be like, oh, that's kind of silly. But it's just so creepy and so weird. Um, 
Uh, basically, the story basically is about a, a woman who is an actress who gets sort of wrapped up in this uh, underworld of Hollywood that somehow magically ties into prostitutes in Russia. <laughs> um, really, when you go into this movie, do not try to make sense of it. Just sit back, watch the visuals, and let it sort of permeate your subconscious, because that's really where this movie dwells, is in your, in your subconscious. And um, if you try to sit there and rationally make sense of it, you're going to hate it. But if you, let it, if you just let it take you for the ride, you're going to love it. Um, so there. Uh, next up is a movie that, when I was 22, right? Yeah, when I was 22 and this came out, really affected me profoundly. And I've watched it since then. And um, it, it doesn't hold up as much now that I'm older. But when you're that certain young, early 20s age, this is a really kind of a profound film to watch in a lot of ways. Because I, I, I think it somehow subconsciously touches on a lot of things that we all feel. And that is Garden State. And uh, I'm a big fan of Zach Braff. You know, Scrubs is my favorite TV show of all time. Um, and uh, when I saw that he was making this movie and I saw the trailer for it, I was like, oh my God, we have to go see that movie. And, uh, we went and saw it and I just remember like all these young people standing up and clapping at the end of it because, and I don't know why I can't explain to you why, but I was one of them. I was like, there was just something about it. Um, the tagline, you know, people were saying it's kind of like the graduate of our, of my age, you know, but I don't really think that's true. It, it's just something about feeling so disenfranchised from everything that's around you, like uh, Andrew Largeman is, and sort of the returning to a, a place that was once your home, but doesn't feel like your home anymore. Uh, there's just something about it that just seeps into a certain mindset of young people that uh, and it really affects them. So, uh, you know, maybe not you know, anymore. It's probably not, you know, a big thing. You know, it kind of got overhyped because of the soundtrack and all that stuff. But um, I still find it to be a very wonderful film, Garden State. Uh, next up, no surprise here, uh, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Really excited for The Hobbit because this is my favorite Lord of the Rings movie because it is still set in sort of the more uh, fantastical parts of Middle Earth. As you move into Two Towers and Fellowship, of, or not Fellowship of the Ring, uh, Return of the King, it w moves more into the world of man and a lot of the magic of the sort of Middle Earth is lost, whereas this one is really, you know, all in uh, the Shire and Elfin Lands, and then it goes into the Dwarven Caves. Um, and it's not really until the end that you meet the world of man. Um, so I'm really excited to see what they do with The Hobbit, because uh, I, I sort of love the more fantastical parts of the Lord of the Rings series. But for some reason, Fellowship of the Ring uh, will always stick with me as the best of the movies. Um, that Inya song at the end um, still, you know, sends shivers up my spine. Uh, fantastic movie. Can't wait for The Hobbit. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because what are you going to say about The Lord of the Rings? Uh, because I want to talk about a movie like this, Brick. And this is directed by uh, Rain Johnson, who has also directed Looper, which a lot of people are really going on about now. It stars uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who I think is probably the best actor of this generation. Um, God, he is so fantastic. 50-50, um, you know, Bat or Dark Knight Rises. Every I mean, everything he's been in is just fantastic stuff. Um, and uh, what this is, this is something really special because I love film noir. Takes everything that film noir is and just upstate, upstates it, updates it to a modern high school. Keeps the same hard-boiled dialogue and everything. It's just it's set in a high school. And um, I don't want to talk any more about the storyline because it's really something that I think you need to experience on your own. But when you get to the end of this film, it is such a fucking gut punch. Um, some people say they see it coming. I don't really think so. Uh, I think they're just, you know, oh, oh I'm smarter than this movie. Um, but uh, so many fantastic characters. I love when characters have nicknames like The Pen and Tug as their names and not like real names. I think that's always wonderful in film. But, uh, God, I just want to go watch this again. Maybe I'll watch it tomorrow. Um, fantastic movie. You have to see it. Brick. And then um, the last four are kind of, um, you know, easy choices. I'm not going to talk too much about some of them, but uh, I had to put Star Wars in here and it had to be Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I would say up until episode three, this was the darkest of the, the films, but I think that this is the most emotion, still the most emotionally weighty of them because of the revelations you sort of get in this. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's still a better film than Episode 3. So even though in Episode 3 you have the whole um, Obi-Wan, Vader, th- uh, Obi-Wan, Anakin thing, Vader thing, um, I still find Empire Strikes Back to be the best of the Star Wars films. Um, and it really shows what Star Wars can be when George Lucas is more hands-off. So I know I made a video about the Disney buying Star Wars and all that stuff a little, a little while ago, but I'm really kind of getting excited to see what Star Wars is going to be without George Lucas, you know, putting Jar Jar Binks into it. Um, I think that he, at one point in time, had fantastic ideas. Watch this, watch THX, um, watch Indiana Jones, watch American Graffiti. He was once a very amazing director. Um, and then I think he got caught up in sort of all the, um, the merchandising and hoopla of Star Wars and sort of forgot how to do that. But um, really excited to see what is going to come from the new Star Wars films. We'll see. Because, um, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna milk that shit for all it's worth. But anyway, uh, still, I think the best lightsaber battle, the most emotionally weighted lightsaber battle um, in any of the films, even against uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, so fantastic. Definitely. Well, I don't have to tell you to check out Empire Strikes Back. Everyone has. Um, Got to get Star Trek on here. And I really uh, went back and forth between... Uh, Star Trek 2 and the new Star Trek and this one and it had to be this one because it is sort of the swan song of the original crew uh, you know very childhood heroes to me everyone you know had childhood heroes like Luke and Han uh, my childhood heroes were the crew of the Enterprise so I had to pick Star Trek 6 the undiscovered country um, Nicholas Meyer back to direct these films again I really think that Nicholas Meyer and Leonard Nimoy should have directed all the films because Nicholas Meyer is a fantastic uh, director for Star Trek um, I wouldn't even mind him taking on the new Star Trek if he could. Um, but, uh, I don't know if JJ will, uh, relinquish the reins or not, but, uh, you know, this is the, you know, the, everyone kind of made jokes about, you know, these old, uh, crew members still running this ship, but, uh, there's just something about this that, I mean, it perfectly, um, sort of, we didn't need generations, I guess. Um, we didn't need Star Trek generations, um, because this perfectly sends the crew off on their final mission and perfectly sets up everything that the Star Trek The Next Generation would become with the uh, Klingon Peace Treaty and all that kind of stuff. Um, fantastic performances, fantastic action, um, just a fantastic film. I really, I, I really do think that this is the best of the original Star Trek movies, um, for my taste at least. Um, yeah, so Star Trek VI, got to be on there. And then the last two, um, Ridley Scott, you know, he's been in my brain since Prometheus came out, so I had to put some Ridley Scott on here. Of course, you have to have Blade Runner, probably one of the most influential films out there. Also very influential in video games. Um, look to Snatcher. I mean, Snatcher is basically a Blade Runner video game. Um, you know, what? I'm not going to harp on this movie except to tell you that if you have not seen this film, go out and get the final cut, watch it. Um, I need to go out and buy the Blu-ray of it. Maybe just buy the, the single disc Blu-ray because I have all the bonus features on here unless I do more bonus features for the new... This is part of the Ultimate Collector's Edition that was in that big uh, Voight-Com uh, carrying case. But um, just go see it. I'm not going to talk about it. One of the most influential sci-fi films ever made. I'm not even going to talk about it. Just go watch it. That's all I'm going to say. Just go watch it. And then uh, really one of his underrated films that I can never shake and... Uh, uh, Mr. RPG Crazy just talked about it and said he, he didn't really find it to be a great film. And I wonder if that's because he didn't have the director's cut. Because this movie was really butchered for theaters. And that is Kingdom of Heaven. Um, King Baldwin IV played um, you, uh, um, anonymously by um, Edward Norton. Um, what a, I mean, whenever he's on screen, I'm just like mesmerized by the mask and everything. There's just something about this film that um, I love. And I'm not a religious person, um, but I think this is a, a really interesting sort of um, movie to watch in this day and age because it's all about the Crusades, which, I mean, in a lot of ways, we're still fighting today. Um, take a look. It's, you know, American Christianism versus Middle Eastern Islam. I mean, it's still the Crusades. Um, I really think that this is a very interesting movie because it sort of shows how things have changed in a lot of ways because in the first crusade 
Um, I think it was the first crusade. I could be wrong because uh, there were so many fucking crusades. But in one of the crusades, you know, Christians took over uh, Jerusalem and basically slaughtered every Muslim that was in the city. Uh, when the Muslims, in, in this movie you get to see that battle, the Muslims retake Jerusalem. They let the Christians go to sea, you know. Um, so, it, and that's a true story. They, they let them go back to their home countries. Um, you know, it, it really shows that uh, both religions can be taken over by extremism. And I think that in the case of, you know, Christianity during the Middle Ages, it was really, you know, Christianity or we put you to the stake. And I think nowadays it's, you know, Islam is getting its turn, um, getting taken over by radicals. So um, it's a really interesting film to watch and really think about um, our sort of modern times, I guess. So I, I, I can never shake this film. I actually kind of really want to watch it again now. Uh, but make sure you get the director's cut. And make sure you get the DVD. I mean, you can buy the Blu-ray uh, version. But if you get the DVD version, you get, I mean, like three or two discs of bonus features all about the making of this. So, um, for some reason, they left that all off the Blu-ray. I don't know why. But, um, you know, you can probably find this for cheap, and then you can get the, uh, the Blu-ray version so you can have it in 1080p. But, uh, yeah, there's just something about it. I don't... I don't mm, Ridley Scott. Love Ridley Scott. Even his bad films, like Robin Hood, you know, uh, which is not that bad, but, you know, so anyway. Uh, wow, made it through them all, so... Anyway, uh, that's just you know some of my favorite movies. Uh, I, I look down now and I realize I left RoboCop off. RoboCop is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, this was not on like a top list. It's just I picked some off the shelf. So um, anyway, I think that's going to be it. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Take care. I'll see you next time.